Welcome to Bible Answers with Philippians 1-9 Ministries. You're listening to Patrick O'Brien. Today we want to look at the subject of false apostles. Now, I want to point you to a free ebook that I created on the five different categories of apostles. Now, I'll put a link to that in the description of this teaching, but you can go to our website, philippians19.org forward slash apostles. And that'll take you to where you can go ahead and grab this PDF ebook. You can download it, print it out, and read all about the five different categories of apostle, including the fifth one in which we will be talking about today, false apostles. So when it comes to false apostles, we have to understand it from the context of what the scripture teaches us about apostles. Now, there are five different categories, right? You have the first category in which you'll see in that ebook that is Jesus himself, the apostle. Then the second category, the 12 apostles. The third category, very similar to the 12 apostles, but these are they who would have had to have seen the resurrected Christ and would have been commissioned by Christ and therefore be apostles of Christ. That includes people like Barnabas and Paul and others. But then we see the fourth category, that is the apostles of the church, or messengers of the church, as Paul refers to them as. And they're those who are sent out not by Christ, but are sent out by the local church. Because remember, apostles is a word that's transliterated, not translated, meaning it's apostolos, and these are those who are sent out. Now, all of that you can dive deeper into on the ebook on our website. But today we're looking at the fifth category of apostle. This is the false apostles. This is a category that does continue today. We still today have false apostles, but by nature they are false. And so we want to look at that in light of scripture. Now, there's no denying that there are true, genuine apostles and false apostles, right? Jesus himself makes this distinction. So this alone proves that there does exist different categories of apostles, And it's our job to understand these differing categories as the scripture teaches them. And so oftentimes you'll see those who claim to be an apostle with governing authority over the church try to say, well, no, there's no, there's no distinctions. We are the apostles and, and so forth. But by nature of Jesus giving us the distinction between true and false tells us that there are at least those two categories, which we know from the scripture that there are indeed five different categories of apostle. Now, we are warned of false apostles, and and those are these people who claim authority that is not from God and who can perform miracles. So we want to look closely at a warning in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, 22 through 23, we read, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So in Matthew 7, 22 through 23, we're seeing people claiming some sort of apostolic or prophetic ministry. Do you see that? Notice prophesying being mentioned, and then an emphasis on casting out demons and performing miracles mentioned. These are signs that particularly follow the true apostles of Christ in the first century, those of the second and third category. So notice in Matthew 7, 22 through 23, that those speaking are not saying, did we not preach the gospel or did we not teach the whole counsel of God rightly dividing it? You see, they tried to be accepted by what they did, by the power they supposedly had. They did not do the will of the Lord, which is to preach the gospel in truthfulness and teach the word, rightly dividing the entire word of God. Now, also notice that many will be caught up in this. Now, the New Apostolic Reformation, or sometimes referred to as the NAR, N-A-R, certainly qualifies as having swept up many into its group or into its grasp of false teachings and their outright mysticism. And we'll look at the NAR in just a moment. Now, Jesus says to them in Matthew 7, I never knew you, meaning he never had a relationship with them. Understand here that God is showing us that just because someone uses the name of Jesus does not mean that what they are doing is authentic or biblical. Obviously, they had what the Bible calls a different Jesus. You can reference 2 Corinthians 11.4, who, 
this this other Jesus, this different Jesus, is their source of their power. They were lawless. They were not under Christ's leadership or the guidance of the biblical Jesus Christ. So let's look at a few different passages. In Revelation 16, 14, we read, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. So notice there are demons that can do miracles. Matthew 24, 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Now, Revelation 13, verses 13 through 14, And he doeth great wonders. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Jesus informs the church that there are and will be false apostles. In Revelation 2, verse 2. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. How do we test false prophets or false apostles? Is what they do, say, and teach conforming to the written word of God. The test, the barometer for truth is always the written word of God. Not our feelings, not how much good they do, not what we see, not what we experience, but God's word, his written word alone. Now these false apostles are liars. They are false apostles apostles because they did not see the risen Lord, nor were they commissioned by him. They do not meet the requirements for the governing apostles of the second and third category. Again, we talk about this in the ebook that's available to you on our website. So how they live and what they teach does not agree with the already written scripture. The teachings of Christ taught by the true apostles or the written word of God. It, what they do, what they teach, does not conform to God's word. Now, these false apostles, as we will see in relation to the New Apostolic Reformation, or the NAR, are claiming to be apostles, not of the fourth category, right? They're not claiming to be apostles of the church. They're claiming to be governing apostles, commissioned by Christ, claiming to have equal or greater authority than the true apostles of the second and third category, meaning those of the twelve and those like Paul and Barnabas and James and others. So, Paul writes about these false apostles and says they are deceitful workers disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. So let's look at that in 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. He says, But what I am doing I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Paul also writes about these men who stray from the the sound doctrine taught by the apostles of Christ. They go beyond what is written to teach doctrines contrary to the apostles' doctrine. Paul tells us they are not servants of Christ— They have smooth and flattering speech. Romans 16, verses 17 through 18. Paul writes, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So it's important here that we look at what Paul's telling us. Okay, those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings you learned are the teachings of the apostles, the apostles' doctrine. And they're going contrary to the scripture. And they do this with their smooth and flattering speech. They're ultimately, they serve their own appetite, and then even more so, They are servants of Satan. 
as they lead people away from the word of God. They lead people away from the Jesus, as we know from the scriptures, away from the written word, and they lead them to themselves and into their own empires built by men. And we see this largely within the New Apostolic Reformation. So to do justice to this fifth category of false apostles, we might as well as look at what we see in our own time. Now, much of today's confusion on the apostolic authority and supposed continuing office of apostle comes from this dangerous movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation or the NAR. Now, these, me these are men today who are saying that the government of the church is to be based on today's end times apostles, which is supposed to uh, the supposed foundation of some new era of the church. Now, the man who coined the term, the New Apostolic Reformation, is C. Peter Wagner. So let's examine some of what he and others are saying. C. Peter Wagner first labeled this church movement post-denominationalism, and this term was dropped in January of 96 in favor of what we know as today, the New Apostolic Reformation. In fact, Wagner explains this in his own book, and, he, and quote, he says, I needed a name. For a couple of years, I experimented with post-denominationalism. The name I have settled on for the movement is the New Apostolic Reformation. This is from his book, The New Apostolic Churches, 1998 edition, page 18. Now, we're going to quote some different, uh, different things from some individuals, and those references are going to be available for you on our ebook with the five categories of apostles, and so you can check that out for yourself. Now, C. Peter Wagner states, I believe that the government of the church is finally coming into place and that the scripture teaches in Ephesians 2 that the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets. Now, this is what Wagner believes, but is it what God has taught? Is God's government finally coming into place? Did the church really have no government or guidance for almost 1900 years prior to Wagner's new apostolic and prophetic movement? Now, we've already explained the passage in Ephesians 2 that men like Wagner and others take out of context, and you can find that in the ebook online. But we're not going to dive into all the different passages they use to refute it with the sound doctrine in context. So you're going to have to print out the ebook for yourselves with that. But regardless, you're going to want to print out this ebook on the apostles. And you can find that on our website, philippians19.org forward slash apostles, or go to the link in the description of this teaching. Now, let's continue on. Wagner has given birth to his own group of leaders in apostolic churches. This movement crosses over literally all denominational boundaries. Apostolic networks are forming and are supposedly the fastest growing segment of Christianity worldwide. There are too many today to name who promote Wagner's concepts of this new church model of the 21st century. This is not a small movement, just as we saw from Matthew 7. Many are going to be caught up into this. Now, we can all agree that there are still missionary apostles with, with us today. And those, they go into unreached areas of the world and they plant churches, right? Those would be apostles or messengers of the church in the fourth category, Okay, but they never held any governing rule. But this is not what Wagner and his associates are teaching or promoting. They are talking about governmental and ruling apostles who claim power from on high and signs and wonders. The apostles of Christ taught the doctrine of Christ, and they wrote scripture and discipled the people in the churches they started. What Wagner is doing is copying the apostolic succession of the Catholic Church with their papacy. The only difference is that there is not just one apostle at a time, but many. Quite frankly, too many. Now, if succession of apostles or apostolic authority was so vitally important to the welfare of the church, why is God's word silent on this practice or teaching? So we can see this analogy now with the Catholic Church having their pope, their apostle, and then passing down that apostolic succession of the Catholic organization, right? And now you see the same thing with Mormons. Notice how we see this activity of apostolic succession among the cults. But I digress. Let's look and see what Wagner says a little bit more. So Wagner writes, 
churches that fail to recognize the position of apostles and prophets, not in a hierarchy but in a divine order, cannot expect to be everything that God originally designed them to be. Wagner goes on to conclude that anyone objecting to his idea of this new apostle-led governance of the church are under the influence of a powerful demon known as the corporate spirit of religion. Now, these types of outrageous statements by NAR apostles are common. When they can't defend their position with God's word, they immediately attack the individual who has the objection. We see this with ad hominem attacks. Instead of dealing with the issue, instead of going to the word of God as people who love Jesus, who love the Lord God, and who love his word and go to the truth itself, they immediately attack you. Oh, you you disagree with me? You have a demon. Just the same thing they did with John the Baptist. Just the same thing they did with Jesus. And just the same thing they do to anybody else who follows Jesus Christ when they come to terms with the fact that what they're teaching does not line up with the word of God. They will call you a demon. Oh, you have a demon. Okay? Now, let's look at this a little further. Another individual uh, in this movement is Bill Hammond. And Bill Hammond says, quote, It is almost impossible for individuals to humble themselves under God without humbling themselves in submission and relationship to Christ's delegated representatives of him to his church. Now, again, these references are in our ebook for you to look for yourselves. Now, apparently, the failure to submit to a NAR apostle is equal to failing to submitting to God. They're putting themselves in that position. Wagner and other NAR leaders promote a type of unity they call apostolic unity. They promote the idea that God's army is strengthened by the Christian submission to today's apostles. They teach that apostles are the spiritual gatekeepers in the city, not pastors. Wagner claims that a failure to let these apostles lead is the reason that communities have not seen significant social transformation. They teach that apostolic unity doesn't necessarily require unified doctrine. Wagner even goes so far as to say that some NAR leaders are oneness Pentecostals who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. NAR leader Bill Johnson, senior pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California, sums up well this heretical teaching when he says it's the apostolic leadership rather than doctrine that is the foundation of true unity. The NAR's claim of unity existing outside of doctrine or the teachings of Christ contradicts the entire New Testament. John makes this clear in many of his writings, but especially in 2 John 9, where he writes, Anyone, anyone who goes too far and does not remain in, again, does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. That's Second John 9. Truth cannot be separated from the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, who inspired the written word of God, which is the truth. John 17, 17. A unity outside the truth of God's word is not a unity in the Holy Spirit, rather it is a false unity. These NAR leaders teach that a failure to submit to a NAR apostle is equal to failing to submit to God. As NAR prophet and apostle Bill Hammond says, he quote, quote, it is almost impossible for individuals to humble themselves under God without humbling themselves in submission and relationship to Christ's delegated representatives of him to his church, remember? So Wagner writes, when we do this, submitting to apostles, the church, government, will be in place to receive the powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our cities, which will lead to social transformation on a worldwide scale. This is what C. Peter Wagner is teaching. Now, signs and wonders were never taught, nor were they preached to attract multitudes of people. Let me say that again. Signs and wonders were never taught, nor were they preached to attract multitudes of people. They absolutely were not used to attract those who already believed. Using signs and wonders the way the NAR leaders do has more in common with sorcery and mysticism 
than it does with anything to do with biblical Christianity. Now, the true apostles of Christ are unique in their ministry, office, and power that was never to be duplicated or continued. They were for a specific period in church history. It is impossible for there to be modern-day apostles of Christ as there was in the beginning of the church, since no one today possesses the necessary qualification to be an apostle of Christ commissioned by Christ as such. We deal with this in great detail in the ebook itself when we talk about the second and third category of apostle, those who are commissioned by Christ, who had seen the resurrected Lord. Now, today there are deceivers claiming to be not only apostles, but better apostles than the first century church. These false apostles today are in serious error contradicting God's word, and misleading millions into their deception. If you doubt that, check out YouTube. Check out social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. These false apostles, these false leaders in the NAR movement, together, literally have millions caught up in their deception. On back of this worldwide deception, as you might guess, is Satan himself. Again, I remind you of 2 Corinthians 11, 12-15. Again, we must ask if appointing new apostles to a governing office is as important for the health and power of the church as men like Wagner claim, then why is the scripture completely silent on any instructions for this appointing? Why is there no practice of it recorded in Acts or all the New Testament? If these NAR apostles cannot support their teachings and practices by the written word of God, then they are indeed false apostles. The Apostle Paul had no problem with the Jews in Berea examining the scriptures to see if what he taught could be supported by the scriptures. Notice, they went to the written scripture to validate a truth claim and not to some prophet in their community. NAR false apostles today view themselves as generals in God's army. Anyone Claiming to be an apostle of Christ today is, by biblical definition, a false apostle. You can have apostles of the church, messengers of the church, church missionaries sent out, but you cannot, by biblical definition, have an apostle of Christ, an apostle sent out by Christ today. Anyone claiming that is a false apostle. These are the deceitful men that God warned us about the ones who are leading the church into a different Christianity outside the parameters of God's word. And again, I'll point you to our Acts study on our YouTube channel, Philippians 1-9 Ministries. And we go verse by verse from the very beginning, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through the entire book. And we do it with a an attention and an awareness of how the New Apostolic Reformation takes certain texts out of context, takes scriptures out of context. And so we go through the book of Acts and we point out the emphasis is emphatically on the teaching and the preaching of God's word. And the signs and wonders we see are from the hands of the apostles and with the exception of the two apostolic legates, which are just as unique as the apostles as well. And again, we break this down in the PDF ebook. So be sure to go to our website, philippians19.org forward slash apostles, or go to the link in the description of this teaching and grab that ebook and study through. Even if you're pretty content, like even if you already think I'm totally convinced, I understand, print it out, study it through anyway. Now, listen, We want to talk about a few more things to consider because I want to leave you with just just a little bit more meat to chew on before we close this teaching. So, among the many dangers and sufferings that the Apostle Paul experienced, he lists false brethren as one of those dangers. Paul informs the leadership of the church in Acts 20.30 that these false brethren will lead people to becoming disciples of themselves rather than disciples of Christ and will lead people away from abiding in the doctrine of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, where he mentions all the different dangers. And the one there we're pointing out is dangers among false brothers. 2 Corinthians 11, and you can see that from verses 23 through 29. Now, these self-proclaimed apostles of Christ today, the false apostles, 
are all about receiving the blessing, the power, the authority, but they ignore the sufferings, poverty, torture, and ultimately the martyrdom of the true apostles of Christ. The Apostle Paul had no desire for wealth, fancy clothing, or position. You can see that in Acts 20, verse 33. Now, one problem so many of these NAR leaders have, as well as those who sit under their teachings, is that they don't understand that God does choose certain people for certain times, for certain tasks, often never to be repeated. And let's just take a moment to look at some of those examples right now. Now, in our ebook, we referenced how this is with the 12 sons of Jacob and them beginning the 12 tribes of Israel, and thus the nation of Israel that grew out of Jacob's family. God has always had special men and women that he has used. The three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were unique men, never to be repeated. Noah, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, and others were men God sovereignly chose to accomplish a task. Even Jesus, during his life and ministry, chose certain men from the twelve apostles to witness certain things. We see this in Matthew 17, when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a high mountain to witness the transfiguration of Jesus. It's also Mark 9 and Luke 9. Jesus does this again when he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he takes him, Peter, James, and John, Mark 14. So God chose Mary to birth the incarnate Son of God. The book of Acts centers around the apostle Peter and Paul. Any other apostles that are mentioned are always in connection with either Peter or Paul. We don't know much about most of the other apostles of Christ because God chose only to share with us the life and ministry of Peter and Paul. There are, of course, many reasons for this, but my point is that God chooses individuals to accomplish tasks unique to those individuals. There are many more examples, but the point is that we are not told to impersonate Bible characters or claim we have an identical ministry and purpose as do some Bible characters. In 1 Corinthians 12.28, we see a list of spiritual gifts, not church offices. Paul doesn't say apostles of Christ here. And he is likely referring to apostles of the fourth category, the fourth category, right? The apostles of the church, who are sent out by the church and who have no governing authority. The only offices mentioned and seen continuing in the church are elders, overseers, and deacons. In Acts twenty twenty eight, we see the Ephesian elders also being called bishops, overseers, or shepherds and pastors. So they're used synonymously there as well. Now. Remember, Satan is a manipulative speaker, and this is common attribute of his throughout the scripture, Revelation 13, 5 through 6, and many, many places. He will be able to do great wonders and will deceive many by the miracles he does have the power to do. He performs great signs. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs that he has given him to perform. That's Revelation 13, verses 13 through 14. Paul writes that, That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 And then, of course, you can reference again what Jesus says in Matthew 24.24. And also, the word for Christ means anointed. Jesus is telling us that there will be people claiming to be anointed who will be able to perform and do signs and wonders. For the purpose of misleading many. We read that even demons will do miracles. Revelation 16, 14. Again, and we need to put this in bold. The presence of signs and wonders is not proof that God is moving. Or that this is a person of God. If what any person does, says, and teaches doesn't conform to the written word of God, then they are not being led by the spirit of truth. This is why John writes in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism, He always appealed to the authority of the written word of God. Jesus did not see the miracles that Satan was doing as any authority or sign 
of God approving Satan. Remember the miracle in Matthew 4, 5, when the devil took Jesus into the holy city and on the pinnacle of the temple? Or when the devil took Jesus to a high mountain and somehow shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in Matthew 4, 8? My point is that the devil tempts and deceives with signs, wonders, and spiritual phenomena. We should be like Jesus and using and appealing to the authority of the written word of God. Jesus, who is God, thought it sufficient enough to appeal to the written word of God during temptation. I think it would be wise for us to do that as well. Now, I want to leave us with a note from Martin Lloyd-Jones, a quote he says. He says, You never find the apostles announcing beforehand that they are going to hold a healing service in a few days' time. Why not? Because they never knew when it was going to happen. They did not decide, and it was not within their control. End quote. All right, so that's going to bring us to the end of our teaching today on false apostles. Now, I would encourage you again, as I have throughout this teaching, to go to our website, philippians 19org forward slash apostles, and grab this 30-page PDF ebook. Now, this is something specifically for students inside of our online Bible college. And these are th- this has to do with the types of teachings that you'll find inside the online Bible college. So if you like hearing these teachings, if you like learning from these teachings, you absolutely need to come check out the online Bible college. You can find more information on that on our website as well. Just go to our homepage, philippians19.org, and you can go to forward slash enroll, or just up in the menu, you'll see Bible College. And we talk all about it there. Now, we also have on our YouTube channel many other teachings that expose the false doctrine and false teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation and the NAR. A lot of the terms that they like to use and with casting out demons and their special powers that they claim and all of this. We have it inside our Philippians 1-9 Ministries YouTube channel and you can check them out there as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, hey, listen, if you've, if you've listened to this entire teaching, can I ask you to do me a favor? Can I ask you to share this with somebody else? Share it on your social media platforms. Text it to somebody. Share it with the people that are going to your church. Share it with the people that you love and share it with the people who might need to hear it. And let them, let them deal with the text. Challenge them to deal with the text. Go print off our 30-page ebook and use it as a study guide to challenge people who are trying to promote the idea that apostles do continue to exist today. If somebody is teaching themselves as an apostle of Christ today with governing power and authority, they are not being led by the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth. And we can say that emphatically and with confidence, because the Word of God speaks against that. And we, as believers of Jesus Christ, need to speak with the authority of God's Word and contend for the faith and refute this sound, and refute with sound biblical doctrine these lies that are being perpetuated today and are bringing ruin upon so many people's lives and are caught, catching them up in deception and ruining their lives because of it. So let us be encouraged and let us share this teaching with others and help me do that. And I would be just so grateful for that as well. All right, brothers and sisters, until we talk next time, press on in Jesus, study diligently his word, and stay prayerful, and we'll talk soon.